Amen. Good morning, Moraine Valley Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter. The Lord is risen. Amen. This is Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday for the Christian. You know, the birth of Jesus is gigantic because God came to became man. Then he lived a righteous, perfect life, sinless, to prove that he was God and the only sacrifice that could be unblemished to pay for man's sin. So he went to the cross on Good Friday and took my sin and your sin upon himself. Died to pay the price was buried to take our sins far away into the grave, but rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday morning to live forevermore. And by God's grace, those who know Jesus have been joined together with that resurrection, and we have a great hope that not only Jesus rose in the past that we celebrate, but we look forward to a resurrection in the future where we'll get a new body and live in a brand new world. This is a day to celebrate. This is a day to celebrate. Amen. A day of great hope. And I have a confession to make. I'm a Cubs fan. Really? Wow. Man, I didn't know there were so many Cubs fans here. That's great to know. Then you know what I'm going to talk about. Cub fans know all about hope. Every year about this time in the spring, what do Cub fans think? This is the year. We are so excited. Maybe this year really is the year. We'll see. But we always start believing that. But it doesn't take long into the season as the defeats start to add up. They're kind of like a little hole in a tire that starts to lose its air gradually. Our hope is totally gone like a flat tire by the time midseason normally comes. But you're on a much more serious level. I've met people along the way that have had so many difficult times and so many trials, and you know what, and they keep on hoping, they keep on hoping, and then eventually they get to that place where they just are afraid to hope again. Their hope has run out as each trial has kind of put a little prick into their heart, and it's just kind of gradually said, well, maybe this time, and then... Maybe this next time, and maybe this next time, and some people are just afraid to hope again. We really do need a hope that is bigger than our circumstances and bigger than our problems, and we need a hope that lasts a lot longer than the situations that we face in our life. And that's what the book of 1 Peter is about. Actually, we're starting it this morning. We're going to continue in weeks to come. But 1 Peter is a book about difficult times, tough times, trials. But the hope that God gives a believer in Jesus Christ right in the midst of those difficult times. That's what Peter's all about. Matter of fact, the, the people that this book was written to was a mixture of Jews and non-Jews. Many of the Jews were displaced from their own home there in Israel and they traveled to uh, Asia Minor, which is really northern Turkey, we would know it today. And as they lived in that foreign land, they were among a group of people in a place that had a totally foreign culture to them. Their beliefs were totally different. Their practices were totally different. Their values were totally different. Uh, their morality was totally different. So they really felt out of place in this new home. But there was another group of people that was written to, and they were people that were born there and grew up there, but they became believers in Jesus Christ. But their life was so radically changed at the core of their being that their own homeland felt like a foreign country to them. Because now they had new values. They had new practices. They had new beliefs. They had a new morality. So they felt totally out of place in their own homeland. On top of that, at this time when this was written, in Rome, persecution had broken out in the mid-60s under Emperor Nero, and Christians were being persecuted severely in Rome. 
I mean, they were being crucified upside down on crucifix. They were lit up as torches in the garden for Nero to use just as sport uh, as, as they were being uh, suffered and martyred for Jesus. Now, Asia Minor was part of the Roman Empire. They were out on the fringes, edges of it, and at that time, they weren't experiencing that kind of suffering. But just the start and the reverberation from the city of Rome was starting to move out into the Roman Empire, and they were starting to feel some of the persecution and trials for being Christians. That's who this book was written to. People that were out of sorts with their own homeland and somehow didn't feel at home, at home. <laughs> People that because they knew Jesus Christ were suffering and being, uh, uh, what you want to say, uh, set aside in a different way and treated unfairly and prejudiced against. And as you turn to the book of Peter, and if you don't have a Bible in front of you, we have them in the uh, seats right in front of you underneath you could uh, look on with the person next to you, or even if you don't have that, if you just have a flyer with you this morning, I put the passage on the back of the flyer we're going to look at today. But this book, Peter, who was in Rome during this time of persecution, was writing to these people in Asia Minor who felt out of place in their own home and were uh, dealing with severe persecution, trials, and suffering. And there's some of you here today that might feel that way. There's some of you here, even in the United States, that feel like, you know, I know the United States is my home, but down in the core of my being, my beliefs and my values and my moralities and my practice are so different than the country I live in. There may be some here today who have actually, because they named the name of Jesus publicly, have suffered the loss of jobs or friendships or persecution or unfair treatment just because of that. I know there's people here today that feel that way. And so the book of 1 Peter is a book that we can relate to today. And it was written to encourage these people about that God has a hope in the midst of tough times that's bigger than the times we go through. If you're in 1 Peter or you're looking on your flyer, we're going to read verses 1 to 6. You get a feel for the passage we're talking about today. And starting in verse 1, he says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithany, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This morning, we want to look at this passage and answer three questions about hope. We want to look at what, what is the basis of this hope? What is this hope exactly, and how do we get it? That's what we're going to try to answer this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1. Basically, what, what is the basis of this hope? He tells us right here at the start. It's tied into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at back at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus being raised from the dead that is the basis of this hope that every believer in Jesus Christ has. You know, resurrection, celebration of Easter is all about resurrection. 
But it's not necessarily just about the event of resurrection. It's about the person who was raised from the dead, Jesus. It's kind of like I said, there's so many Cub fans or I didn't realize I was among so many friends this morning. <laughs> but it's kind of like if Chris Bryant hits a home run. It isn't the home run that you give all the glory to. It's Chris Bryant you give the glory to because he's the one who did it. Jesus is the one who was raised from the dead. And we don't want to just get caught on the event of the resurrection. We want to be caught on the person of the resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection. The resurrection and hope is really found in a person, not in an event. And we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that as we go on. But we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday because when we look back in the past, we see something that became the basis of our salvation along with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ becomes the basis of why we're saved today. We celebrate the resurrection because of the power it has in our life today. That event that happened 2,000 years ago has power in the life of the believer of Jesus Christ in the way they live today. But we also look forward to a future resurrection. And we celebrate along with this passage today that focuses upon this future resurrection, this time when we're able to enter into the hope, the inheritance that's reserved in heaven for us it's because of this future resurrection when we will be raised from the dead and our bodies will be changed and we're given new bodies that we are able to enter into this hope. So the basis of this hope is the resurrection of Jesus, the future resurrection which we will be joined together with, with him when he comes back and calls his own. And so the whole basis of this passage is built on that future resurrection enter into that hope. Look back at verse 5. He's talking here about a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This hope is about something that is yet to come. We rejoice about the salvation that we have right now and what we've tasted of God's goodness right here in the land of the living. But the full expression of that salvation is yet to come. And this passage is talking about not just the celebration of the taste of the resurrection that we have right now, but that future when we are able to completely enjoy all the grace that God is going to give to us as his children as he fulfills all of his promises to us. And so this passage is looking forward to a future resurrection at the time when Jesus returns, a salvation that is yet to be revealed. And believers, you're already enjoying the salvation you have. We can rejoice in another salvation that is yet to come as we enter more fully into all the gifts that God has to give us. And at that time, when Jesus returns, our bodies will be raised from the dead They'll be changed. They'll be changed into bodies like Jesus' bodies that will never die. And a body that is suited to live in a brand new environment in the kingdom of God and eternity. So this hope that we look forward to is totally based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what he did in the past to save us. It's what he's going to do in the future to let us enter more fully into the completeness of that salvation. It's going to be that resurrection where our bodies are totally changed to live forever in a brand new environment that only a new kind of body can handle. So the basis of this hope is the resurrection of Jesus. What is this hope? What is this hope? Look back at the text in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living, living hope. Basically it means this. This hope lasts and never dies. It will never encounter anything big enough to stop it. It will never encounter enough defeats like us Cub fans that kind of lose hope 
and we say, you know what, it's gone, it's waning, it's losing. This hope lives on. Doesn't matter how many crises you face in your life, doesn't matter how big your problems are, this is a, li- this is a hope that nothing can crush. Even all the persecution of Rome, all the rejection of being a Christian, all the sense of being out of sort in the world they live with, nothing at all can stop this hope from continuing on. And then he describes specifically in verse 4 what this hope is. Something greater than the Cubs winning the World Series. But rather this hope is this, to to obtain an inheritance. An inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This is our hope. Our hope is an inheritance. He says this inheritance is imperishable. When something perishes, it dies. You know, we we go to the store, we buy uh, perishables. They rot away slowly. What he's saying is is that this inheritance that is awaiting us in heaven that is yet to come is never going to die. It's not even going to spoil a little bit. It's not even going to rot a little bit. It's imperishable. He goes on to say it's undefiled. That means it's flawless. This inheritance that God has for us is without flaw. It's not spotted. It's not stained. It's not torn. There's nothing about it that is defiled. And then finally he says, and it will not fade away. You know what he's saying here is it will never lose its greatness. When we, you know, we, our bodies, great example, we're born, we start to live our life, it starts to fade over time and goes away. What he's saying, you know what this inheritance is? It's something that will be at 100% throughout eternity. It will not lose one percentage of its glory. As time goes on, it will not fade away. It will not lessen. It will not diminish. But this inheritance, which will never die, will never rot, is flawless, is something that's going to be at its 100% full operation, value, so to say, glory throughout eternity and never lose one bit of it. That's the inheritance we have awaiting us. Well, what is the inheritance? Okay, we kind of described it a little bit. Let's try to bring it down a little bit on the lower shelf. Simply as this. When you read Scripture, and we're not going to try to do a study today on the inheritance throughout Scripture. There are other passages, but I want to summarize for you what it is. This is the inheritance that's reserved in heaven for us. It's the time when God fulfills all the promises that he has made about his kingdom and eternity. It's all the promises of God that are yet to be fulfilled. When we read the scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, we've tasted of many of the promises and the things that God's given. But God, there's so many other things that yet we're looking forward to that are yet not have happened The inheritance is the fullness of all the promises that God has given to us about the future, about the kingdom of God, about eternity with God. It's that time when we will share in the reign and the glory of Jesus Christ. That's part of our inheritance according to the scripture. There's a time coming when every believer in Jesus, when Jesus is reigning right here on earth for a thousand years, we're going to share in that reign with him. And the scripture says when he comes back, we're going to share in his glory. And so part of the inheritance is that time when we share in the reign and the glory of Jesus. The inheritance is that time when I get that new body, that that promise that's yet to be fulfilled of this body that's going to be changed. And I can't wait for my new body, i got to be honest with you, for a whole bunch of reasons. Many of them are obvious, some aren't. But you know what, I'm sure some of you say, man, I can't wait for that new body. That new body that will never know sickness and pain and disease or death, that will live on forever, and that is changed to live and suited to live in a brand new environment. 
Because that's part of the inheritance that we have. A new heaven, a new earth. The whole order of things changed from what we know. So we're going to have a brand new body that's fit to live in a brand new environment. One that has never been touched by sin nor ever will be touched by sin. That's what we look forward to. And so we could really spend months, maybe years, studying about all the promises that fit this. But the inheritance is about all that that God has yet to give us, that he's promised us out there in the future, that we look forward to as a great living hope for us. When you read Revelation 21 and 22, I'm just going to tell you a little bit and give you a little taste of what that inheritance looks like and some of those promises that are to come. It's going to be a time when there's no more graveyards because there'll be no more death. There'll be no more funerals, no more tearful goodbyes, no more emotional pain, no more depression or rejection or separation or abuse or loss. There'll be no more hospitals. There'll be no more cancer, no more deformity, no more disease, no more migrating headaches, no more need for painkillers, no more back pain. I'm so looking forward to that. No more health insurance. You won't need health insurance. Why, why do we need health insurance? No more food pantries or food stamps. No more sin to affect people, their relationships, their work, or even the earth. The earth will be fully productive and beautiful. But also means this, never again will we suffer persecution, mocking, conflict, or death over beliefs or values that are different with those who are unbelievers. Nothing shameful or no one shameful, vile, detestable, or unpleasant will be there. No news reports telling us about murders that happen in the big cities. We can walk the streets safely and without fear. No more adultery, no more rape, no more sexual abuse. No more demonic influences through witchcraft or drugs. You can trust anything and everything that is said. There will be no shaky deals or misrepresentations. And God will be our God and we will be his people, and he will live right here among us. And he'll be the greatest love of everybody's heart. That's a taste. That's the hope this passage is talking about. That's the inheritance, but there's so much more. That's just a little tasting. When you read Revelation 21 and 22, the Bible is loaded with descriptions of the great inheritance that God has for us that we're waiting for. And this kind of inheritance is big enough and strong enough and last that no matter what kind of situation you're facing in life, the hope that this gives is greater. And you know what it's like when you lose hope, guys. You're in trouble. <laughs> hope sustains the heart. It's the thing that in the midst of difficult times gives me the ability to get up tomorrow morning and keep going, knowing that at some point and at some time there's a better future that awaits me. We don't have to quit. But when you lose hope, guys, you get up and say, what's the use in going on? What's the use in getting up? You keep on going. So the basis of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is this hope? It's the inheritance of all the promises that God's made for us that we're looking forward to in the future. The final question we have this morning is this. How do I get this hope? How does it become mine? Look back at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Born again. How do you get this hope? You have to be born again. Look at what Jesus said in John 3.3. 3. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All those promises that we're hoping in, that inheritance that's yet out in the future that we're looking forward to, Jesus said, there is no way that you will ever see those promises fulfilled in your life. There's no way you'll ever see that kingdom unless you are born again. The means of entering into this hope is being born again. Born again means being born a second time, born again. You need to be born a second time. You need a new birth. You need what is called a spiritual birth. For according to the words of Jesus, you will never see God's kingdom. According to the words of this verse, you can never have that great hope of that future that we're looking forward to. You see, spiritual birth is a lot like physical birth in this sense. When we're born physically, I'm given physical life. And I'm given all the equipment physically to live in this physical world. You see, I'm given all, all the equipment with my body to be able to live and, and interact with this physical world. Well, when you're born spiritually the same way, this time you're born in your spirit and you're given all the spiritual equipment that is necessary for you to traffic in the spiritual world. You see, just like being born physically gives me everything I need to live in this physical world, being born spiritually gives me everything I need to live in the spiritual world and to have a relationship with a spiritual God, a God who is spirit. On the bottom shelf, this is how I would say it. Being born again means that you have a heart transplant. What happens is, is the old heart that Scripture says is dead. It's wicked. It doesn't really move towards the things of God. It may move towards religion. It may move towards good deeds. It might move towards morality. It might move towards being good. But moving towards God in a living relationship, that old heart doesn't do. And being born again says, God gives me a brand new heart. He takes out that old heart and he places in a brand new heart that's sensitive to the things of God. To the way that God has ordered life to be in these days and in these times. It's a heart that longs to see Jesus treasured every day in my life and in this world. It's a heart that is brand new, that has all the equipment that I need now to be in a relationship with God and to live with God on a daily basis and be set in my spirit to be able to enter into his kingdom and to be able in that future when I'm resurrected and when my body catches up to my deep down spirit that's already been changed and I get that new body that allows me to enter into that great inheritance that I hope for. See, that's what it means to be born again. And what God does is he places inside of that new heart his very spirit. And so now you have the very spirit of God living in you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ because he gave you a brand new heart that's equipped for that. See, my old heart couldn't house the Spirit of God, but the new heart can. And the very Spirit of Christ comes and lives inside of me. And you know what? It's that Spirit that produces in my heart and whispers to me a hope and says, you know what? There's a better day coming. It's that Spirit inside of me when I'm going through difficult times that gives me the strength 
to be able to live in those times the way that God wants me to live and to be able to look forward in the midst of a mess that I may be encountering now. But in the midst of that mess, it's the Spirit of God inside of me whispering, say, Pat, you know what? There's a better day coming. Hang in there. Continue to trust me. Continue to entrust your soul to me. Don't respond in sinful ways, but continue to walk with me because someday, Pat, there's something out there that's so much better. Keep walking with me. And it's that spirit inside of me and inside of every believer that supernaturally produces a hope. This isn't something we have to drum up. It's something that God places deep within the heart of a believer in Jesus Christ. So my question to you this morning is this. Well, let me say what my question is not. My question this morning is not this, are you religious? My question this morning is not, do you go to church? My question this morning is not, do you do good deeds? My question this morning is not, are you basically a good person? My question this morning is not, are you better than most people? My question is not, do you live a moral life? My question is not, are you trying hard to be all that God wants you to be? That's all part of the old heart. That's part of the old ways. That's not God's way. The question this morning is this. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Have you had that heart transplant? Do you have brand new desires in the core of your heart? I'm not asking this morning whether you believe or not. Often we talk about that. We're talking, as the passage talks about this morning, about being born again. And when you're born again, guess what? Your heart has brand new desires. Let me ask you this morning, does your heart long to see Jesus glorified in your life? Does your heart long to see him treasured? Does your heart long to be all that God wants you to be? Does your heart long to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? And I'm not saying you may, that we all do it perfectly. <laughs> Matter of fact, I can tell you as the pastor, I don't do all that perfectly. But you know what? I long to. There's something in my heart that says, I want to be that kind of person. God, would your spirit make me that? So my question this morning is, what's the desire of your heart? You know, when you have a new heart, you have a new perspective. What you see about life, what you see about uh, yourself, what you see about Jesus and what he did, what you see about God, everything has changed and your perception is radical. And I want to ask you this morning, the way you see life, the way you see yourself, the way you see God, has that changed at the core of your being? Has your core changed? I'm not talking about has your behavior changed. We're not talking about behavior modification this morning. I'm talking about at the core of your being is everything different. I know the day I came to know Jesus, everything changed. You know, I hear people say, well, you just had to start going to church. It's kind of like the old thing. You say, you know, if you put a mouse in a cookie jar, it doesn't make it a cookie, does it? If a person goes to church, it doesn't make them a Christian. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take a miracle of making that mouse a cookie. Yeah. It's going to take a miracle of that person who's sitting inside of a church building on Easter Sunday morning at the core of their being for God to reach down and to pull out that old heart and give them a brand new heart and place his very spirit inside of that heart because he who has the son has life so how do i get this new heart you know like physical birth we didn't do anything to get physical birth totally a work a joy a pleasure of our parents nothing i did to be born physically and the same thing is true spiritually it's not a work of mine. It's a work of God. God has done all the work for a person to be born spiritually. And he did it through his son Jesus. And when Jesus came to earth and was born as the God-man, 
the sinless one and walked the perfect life to prove that he was without sin and went to the cross as the perfect sacrifice as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who paid for my sins, who was buried in the ground to take my sins far away, was rose again with a brand new life to give me a brand new life. See, God did all the work through Jesus. And what I need to do, sort of say, Jesus said this, well, what's the work of God? This is the work of God, that you believe on him. That you believe on him. God did all the work. The human response to that is to rely upon that work as the means to get you that brand new heart and that brand new life so that you can spend eternity with God. The thing we have to do is this. We have to start. Admit, I don't have it. I don't have that new heart. Maybe I've been going to church, maybe I've been trying to be better, but I never got that brand new heart. I've never been born again. That's the place we got to start and say, you know what, God, I've been running my own life my own way, and I don't have this heart. I need this new heart. That's the place you got to start. You got to recognize what you don't have before you can go to God to ask Him to give you what you need. And so if you're here this morning, say, you know what, I don't have that new heart. That's the place you need to start is by admitting that. The second place is this. You need to believe that Jesus did all the work for you. Maybe more than just an intellectual belief, you need to declare it. In other words, this morning, I'm making a declaration before God and man and saying, you know what? I recognize that there's nothing I can do that Jesus did at all. That when he died, he paid for my sins. And when he rose again, he's given me a brand new life. And you need to make a declaration at the core of your being saying, I believe that. I admit I don't have that heart. I admit and I believe and recognize Jesus did all the work for me to get it. And the third part is, is I need to rely upon him. I want to make a little distinction this morning between believing and relying how many of you here believe that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are trying to position themselves to become the next president of the United States? Anybody believe that in here? Yeah, well, you believe it. How many are relying upon that to pay the bills next week? See, there's a big difference between believing and relying. You following me? <laughs> How many in here believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and rose again to give you new life. How many of you are relying upon that rather than your good works and your efforts and your religion to get you into this future kingdom and eternity that's the hope and the inheritance that we have? There's a big difference between believing it and relying upon him. And I want to encourage you here this morning, if you're one of those people who says, I don't have a new heart, don't just intellectually agree with the facts that Jesus is God, that Jesus died in my place, but you need to rely upon that as the means and the hope and the only way that I can ever enter in and be born again with that brand new heart and his life living in me and all the promises that are yet awaiting me in the future to become mine. I want to encourage you this morning, make this the day that you do that. You know, you may be wondering, and I, if the worship team could get in place right now, you may be wondering and saying, can God really give me a hope that is big enough and endures long enough to overcome my problems. There's people here that, I know there's people here because we're people. We live in this world. Life happens. Hard things happen. People have lost babies. People have lost loved ones. People have lost relationships they had great hopes in that someday this would be the thing that somehow fulfills them deep within inside. 
People have lost jobs in this economy. Because they lost jobs, many people have lost their homes. You found there's, there's big things going on. We look at the world around us. And we take a look and we say, wow, even the, the threat of terrorism and the way that is just hitting every place in the world and has already hit us and when's it going to hit us again? And we look out there and there, there's some gigantic things that we're facing. Is there really a hope that's bigger than these things? You know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I've been through different things in my life. And th this is just what I want to tell you here on this. I've had broke, you know, I don't know, some of you have bro broken dreams can be big. That's what sends men into midlife crisis, if you don't know. <laughs> I've been there. And I've trusted Jesus through that crisis, and I had a hope through that crisis that, God, there's a better day awaiting me. But you know what? I've had broken dreams. I've had a broken body more than once. I've had broken relationships that have, have broken my heart. I've had some deep personal struggles and I know what depression's about. I've been through some long-term deep depression. I can tell you this. There were some times that I just had to dare to believe that God had something better out there for me. But there's other times that the Spirit of God just raised up something in my heart and I just knew that there's a better day and a better time awaiting me and I could walk through these times by his grace. There's a man whose name was Horatio Spafford. He was from Chicago, a wealthy lawyer. Actually, in the 1800s, life was going pretty good for him. He was pretty wealthy. Beautiful family of a, a wife, four daughters, and a son. And all of a sudden, life took a change on him. And it was in the darkest moment of his life that he wrote a song that has inspired hope in literally hundreds of thousands of people over the years. What happened to Horatio was this. His son died, his only son. Absolutely broke his heart and his wife, as you would imagine, losing a child. And not long after that, the Chicago fire hit. And Horatio had a whole bunch of real estate holdings and he lost almost every bit of those holdings that he had in the Chicago fire. Well, through the loss of their son and the loss of much of their wealth, as they were rattling from that, they planned a vacation to Europe. They needed some time to get away and just grieve what was going on in their life. And so they, they got tickets for a boat to take them to Europe. And some last minute details came up that Horatio had to stay a couple days extra to, before he could go to be able to join the rest of the family. So he sent his wife and daughters on the boat over to Europe and he was going to meet them. Well, on that boat ride, the boat encountered a collision. All four of his daughters drowned and his wife barely survived. Horatio had heard about this, and uh, later he received a telegram from his wife saying, saved alone. He knew at that time that his four daughters had died. Horatio got on a boat to go over to meet his wife, Anna, in England to be with her during this time of deep grief. And when that boat hit the spot where his four daughters drowned, he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows row, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And as we sing that song now, you'll notice in the very last phrase, He's looking forward to that day when his faith will be sight. He's looking forward to that day of the inheritance. He's looking forward to that day of the resurrection. He's looking forward to that day when he can once again be with his daughters and son as he sings with great hope. And as we sing this morning, let this song bring encouragement to you that even in the midst of our darkest times, it can be well with our soul because God can give us a hope for that future. Amen. Yeah.